Upside down, hanging out of an airplane. Welcome to Our Town. I'm your host, Larry Frost, and today we're at the Housing Authority, where we'll be talking with Director Bob Mazzoni. So, let's go in. Hi, I'd like to meet Bob Mazzoni of the Housing Authority. He's the director, one in his office, and he's going to give us a rundown of the Housing Authority and what he likes about Ainsbury and what he likes about his job. So, nice to meet you, Bob. Hey, Larry. Nice to meet you, too. Um, Ainsbury Housing Authority has been in existence since 1948. Um, it was originally developed right after World War II, both as a housing program for returning veterans and also as a job creation program for returning veterans. And we have a small portion of our inventory down on Macy Street is a veteran's house. Many Ainsbury residents, uh, many of them grew up, I found, and spent uh, some fairly enjoyable days down, uh, actually the Powell River runs right down behind it. It's mm -hmm. next to the middle school oh, yeah. property. Yep, down here, yeah. um, and uh, that actually was the was the the origins of the housing authority. Many housing authorities were formed in the in the late 40s after World War II to uh, take advantage of this program offered by the state. Ainsbury Housing Authority has both federal and state programs. The majority of them are state operated programs. They're funded through the state uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, and um, we've had our ups and downs with regard to funding for uh, doing the kind of work we need to do, keeping our buildings in shape providing adequate housing for our tenants. Um, and now we're here we are, um, better than 50 years on uh, oh, know, yeah. on the books. We have 263 units of, of housing, and we also offer approximately 100 vouchers of housing. Oh, wow. So we manage about 400 units here in Ainsbury, and one of the challenges of Ainsbury is we also run the Merrimack Housing Authority from here. Um, we have separate maintenance staffs, but the office workers actually work on both house, for both housing authorities. And I am executive director of both, and I have board meetings and board directors. For That's both, why you're so busy. <laughs> for both separate housing authorities. It's a challenge, but it sure keeps me busy. And I, on occasion, I end up being uh, the maintenance backup guy from, from Merrimack. So I, um, the go-to guy. Yeah. I mean, it's just a matter of making everything work, and I'm fortunate that I can do that. Um, but it's a great business. Um, I love the work. I've done it for 30 years. Um, I actually started, I'm a native of Massachusetts. I grew up in Medford. Um, but I, I went to school at Boston University. I went into Vista for two years, and that took me to Wisconsin. Okay. Um, and at that time, I worked, I worked in a halfway house situation where we not only worked with young men, but we also rebuilt homes and occupied them at low cost. So you have a lifetime of helping people. Well, I mean, it's, you know, I like doing it because I enjoy the work. I like seeing people grow and, and be successful because of, of whatever modest amount of energy I put into it, a lot of folks, if they have, they have self-direction, all they need is a break. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had some breaks in my, when I was a kid growing up, and they had a tremendous effect on how, oh, yeah. how I could grow up. And, um, and I just think that if you offer, you always find people who fail, but, but you have to kind of write the, them off because they would have written themselves off right. anyway. But there's always those folks who uh, really want a chance to, for, to, to prosper, right. and, and those are the ones that keep you going. Yeah. You know, and we have, you know, out of our 263 units that we actually own, 50 of those are family. And the family, and you see that in families. You see families that are dysfunctional and, and really can't make it, and other families who are very proactive. Their kids are doing well in school. They, 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 they want to get, they want to uh, succeed in life. And, um, and you know, we get to see the full gamut of. So you don't need to be a top-notch person, individual. You can just. No, you come in, you set it up, and then um, a lot of this. I mean, housing is one of the most significant aspects of anybody's life. Shelter is one of the key. I mean, it, it's really the basis for our well-being. Mm -hmm. You know, and we identify so strongly with with our housing, and what we try to do is provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing for anybody, 
the bill, and, it, and your income doesn't matter. And one of the blessings of public housing is you can pay according to your income. Where today can you find housing no, no, that is, you know, we have people paying 30% of their monthly adjusted income for rent if all utilities are included. So if somebody's income is, say, $600 a month on, on Social Security, SSI, they pay about $200 a month to live in one of our units. Mm -hmm. And they're not, I mean, these aren't, this isn't the Ritz, but they're good, nice, help clean units, okay. they're they safe. Give some people the control of the life too, they feel a little yeah. more control. Yeah, plus we also have, especially in the tower, at, at Heritage Tower on 180 Main Street, we have 102 units. We have special programs called supportive housing that actually help people to readjust if they have to go in a, uh, to, to rehab for a while, they come back and they need special services like mm -hmm. look-in service, home care services. We have a nutrition program here that serves anywhere from 15 to 35 people a, a, a day on that uh, comes out of um, Andover oh. Lawrence um, Vocational School. They have mm -hmm. a culinary arts program. It's called the Merrimack Valley Nutrition Program. Is and that out of the senior center? No. Uh, well, actually, we're separate? affiliated with the senior center. We're actually a satellite of theirs. Okay. But we have our own meal program here where they bring the food to us. Oh. Okay. Oh. Because for, for many years, our folks, if they wanted to partake of this program, they had to go to the Council on Aging. Now they don't. Now we bring the food to them, which I think makes better sense. Oh, yeah. Bring, yeah. Given the fact that some of them, we have, a, we have um, one tenant here that's over 100, and many in their 90s. We have people who have lived here for 30 years. In, in this facility? In, in one Heritage Tower. And, many, and, and we have, I know we have a, another centurion over Powell. And they, and they love their homes. It's a, it's a, the thing about our housing is we provide reliable, uh, secure housing. Mm -hmm. yep. There's no surprises. People know their neighbors. It's probably as stress-free as you can be oh, yeah. in housing. Okay. And thankfully, because Angelie is such a wonderful town, it's fairly secure. We don't have a real problem with drugs or, or, or um, you know, or uh, you know, folks trying to break in. We don't have that kind of serious right. like you would in some of the larger cities. So it's ideal. I mean, I think we take it serious for the protected people in our town. Yeah, right, right. Well, I'm more blessed too. We're we're a town of at least sixteen thousand. I've heard it could be more than that, but. Yeah, they, don't send back their, they don't send back their census forms. Uh, send back your census forms <laughs> so that the town clerk knows how many people live here. Um, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, every, a many, uh, there's 250 housing authorities in Massachusetts out of 360 some odd communities. Um, and I belong to a group of housing authority directors that are from Essex and Middlesex counties. And, and there's, we actually represent half the inventory of affordable housing in the Commonwealth. Wow. 25,000 units of affordable housing in Essex and Middlesex counties combined out of the 50,000 in the Commonwealth. Now, do you go like once a month for a Yeah, we have updates? meetings once a month. Well, we, we get in-service training. We have people come in and talk to us about retirement issues and health and safety issues. And uh, we had somebody come in last year from public health to talk about the bird flu. I mean, you know, just That's informational sessions. Informational, we, yeah. That's we meet down in... Um, down in, uh, we're, we changed recently, Linfield down at uh, Spinelli's on Route 1. So it's, uh, it's very helpful um, for all of us to get down there and also to commiserate too because we do such singular jobs. Housing Authority directors, we're the only ones. It's kind of like a mayor in a way. I mean, uh, so we don't have anybody that in our town to talk to because nobody does the work we do. Okay. You know, so it's nice to be able and to talk to In the town, but it's not really affiliated by the town. Right. We are under state law, a separate municipality. We do exactly um, cover the same territory as the town we're a part of. Just like in Merrimack, we are the housing authority for the town of Merrimack. Mm -hmm. We are the housing authority for the town of, Mer uh, of Amesbury. And we serve that population. I mean, there's no difference. It's like an overlay. Yeah. But, um, but we are a separate corporate entity under state law, okay? Our employees are, are called special municipal employees. They, so they're and not this state is good information. So make they're sure not state employees it. and they're not city employees. So a lot of people think, and it's understandable, they think that we're part of the city government. We aren't. I meet with the mayor. I thought that. I meet with the mayor. As a matter of fact, I met with him yesterday to talk with, about some common problems, and he's been very engaging for us. Mayor Kieser and his predecessor David Hilt and his predecessor um, Nick Costello have all been in the seven years I've been here have all been really. Uh, uh, kind and, and open and uh, tried to engage the Housing Authority and consequently we also and the board of the Housing Authority has tried to uh, make sure that this is part of the town of Amesbury mm -hmm. and not a separate entity. We, we, we try to have meetings here, we offer our rooms for training programs. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we try to cooperate as close as we can with the Community Development Office, uh, with Joe Fagan and his, and his staff. And generally, we found um, this is a great home. I mean, this is a great uh, host city for a housing authority. Um, and we do provide housing for some of the folks who couldn't otherwise find decent housing. And, and, um, and it, you know, it's, it's a wonderful program. It's one I love because I see not only are we helping folks as they age in place who are maybe in their 80s or 90s and becoming more frail, um, and they can live in a secure environment where their families can come and visit them, but they still have their own place. Mm -hmm. And it's 400, our average- Independence. Yeah, our average housing unit is, and for, for the elderly and disabled, our one bedroom units are 450 square feet with a full kitchen and a full bath. And I'll, if you want, Larry, I'll show you one of them. That'd be great. Um, and uh, they're just enough to manage, they give people the kind of uh, security and independence that they need, but it's not too much. It's not like living in a big house, trying to maintain it, trying oh, to pay yeah. fuel bills. Particularly up and downstairs and all that. Yeah, things. exactly. Yeah. And having a basement that has uh, leaks, you know, like my mom, who's in her 90s. Um, and, you know, it just offers people, they just don't have to think about stuff that they had to think about when they were raising mm -hmm. a family and right after retirement when they were still healthy. And it gives, it, it affords them an opportunity to just concern themselves with the things that matter. Getting a decent meal, taking care of their health. Oh, yeah. You know, having the kids over or going to visit the children and basically enjoying their later years. Okay, so it'll be helpful. Two quite, they're, they're minor, but um, do you see more housing being put up in Ainsbury or Merrimack? Is there a plan to make more? Well, the Housing Authority has been, the, we are the beneficiary of programmatic housing programs, meaning that the state or the federal government typically put a set, chunk of money aside and say, go build this. Um, that Those kinds of programs have dried up a lot, both at the federal level and the state level. The state is now has a program uh, they call it Chapter 40B, where they're trying to build more affordable housing. Um, and, and you're supposed to have a 10%, you're supposed to, 10 of your housing in, in any commonwealth in each town is supposed to be affordable. Oh, city. Now we actually, because of our, we serve a, a population that is lower in income than the average, um, we generally satisfy a portion of that 10%. In Ainsbury, we satisfy about half. Well, about 5% of the 10%, in other words, half of that 10%, yeah is represented by our inventory. But as the community grows, our inventory portion gets smaller because we're oh, not yeah. growing, yeah. Yeah. okay? We've been at the same number of units for quite a few years. You start out with a base number and then just creeps up. And you know, there, and, and it's not easy sometimes to build affordable housing because whatever neighborhood you go into, there's this, this uh, concept called NIMBY, not, not in my backyard, it's, it's an acronym for We, we not, want it, but someplace not else. Not in my, yeah. <laughs> you can build it in this community, but just don't build it, yeah. you know, in my neighborhood. Um, and it's a problem that we have. And I'm sure that it's a problem that the builders of the housing that we currently have had to grapple with as oh, well. Yeah. But they used to be able to take property under what's called eminent domain. And now the housing authority in Ainsbury can no longer do that because that was, my understanding is when the charter for the town changed about 10, 15 years ago, that was, that was taken away from the Housing Authority. So the town is now the only entity that can take property like that, which is fine. Yeah. I mean, but, but in, in, in response to your question, the two key elements of being able to build more housing are not there. We can't take property if we feel a need. If there's money on the table and, and the state says, you have two years to spend this money to build this type of housing, um, that money isn't there now. And the ability to take property, like was taken to build this tower mm -hmm. and many of our other properties, okay, very nice is, is also not there. So two really key components. So you can't get you can't get the funding. Like, I mean, just somebody wanted to donate. Right, the money funding to isn't the there, and also the uh, the ability to take property to use that funding is not there. So if you were talking about you know like the fire triangle, yeah. two of the sides of that triangle oh, yeah. aren't there. Yeah. So I mean, we are trying to make the best of what we have. And trying to find, job trying to find new ways of um, converting housing and using housing um, so that we can serve the needs of the individuals that we see uh, that require services. How would someone get into the, the housing authority? We have an open application process. Unfortunately, we don't have a website. I'd love to do that, but it, it costs a little more, much, too much money than I can afford to do. Um, and you have to maintain it. Right, so we have, um, we have applications that are available at 180 Main Street or you can write to the Ainsbury Housing Authority at 180 Main Street, um, Ainsbury Mass, 01913, and request an application. If, um, if you have a friend in Merrimack, they can request an application from Merrimack as well because we manage 54 units of housing in Merrimack and 22 vouchers. Um, so all told, we're, we, we oversee uh, a little bit over 400 units between the two communities. 
you don't need, I don't want to say this incorrectly, but you don't have to have a, um, a health problem or something else no. to get in here, right? It's not a question it's just of a need for No, housing. you don't, no. If you're, if you, you can be eligible two ways to live in our single family, uh, in our one bedroom homes, and that's, um, you have to be 60 or you have to be disabled. Um, and if you, you can be, we have some folks in their 20s and, and they have a, a life threatening illness um, and they can't, uh, they can't earn the living and they qualify for SSI, SSDI and they are eligible for housing. So we don't discriminate in that regard. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, 13 and a half percent of our population has to be people under 60. That was a state law that was passed about 10 years ago, which is fine. It sometimes creates problems for us because we're mixing very young people in amongst people who are in their 80s and 90s. And there's a concept called intergenerational conflict that on occasion, we haven't had too much of a problem here with it because most of the young people we have living amongst us have been wonderful neighbors. Mm -hmm. But on occasion, you have folks that just don't fit in. And that, that creates a management and problem. And that's not really the age thing, it's probably more the individual. It's a cultural issue cultural, more than it yeah. is aging. Yeah. I mean, it's called intergenerational conflict. It could be called intercultural conflict. I mean, for all, you know, yeah. I remember when, I, when I, worked in, I worked in the field in Wisconsin too, and I was in an elderly housing complex um, where uh, a woman's neighbor had had a, he had a poster on his apartment door, of Judas Priest. I don't know if you, that was a rock group that was, had very satanic, very scary images. And, and you know, it, a lot of those folks weren't used to that. It was, and that's the cultural issue. That yeah, not even a thing on religion, it's just a, it's a yep. slam bang. Thing. And that sometimes, you know, young people love their music, and when they live so in such close proximity to people, some of them who may be hard of hearing, I mean, we do have a problem with noise sometimes because people are, you know, just don't have their hearing aids on. Um, but, you know, young people like their music, so, you know, I mean, I'll, you know, I would many often times ask them, would you please buy a set of headphones? I know you love your music, but your neighbors two or three doors down oh, yeah. don't particularly enjoy it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, the whole block. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's part, that's part of, that's part of when you bring people together with very disparate cultural backgrounds, you know? I mean, we're fairly fortunate. We, uh, you know, we, most of the folks are from Amesbury or the area and they mm -hmm. want to live here. Um, and, it, and there's really not that much difference in the cultures. It's just, a, it's a matter of youth. Right. Versus yeah. people who have been here a long you're time. You're very close to town too. So you yeah, we're well, walking distance for most folks. Uh, and we try to bring the services, like I said, we have a nutrition program in place. We have actually a weekend meals program so that people can get at least one meal a day here. And that's real important for good, oh, yeah. not only good nutritional health, good psychological the issues. The Senior Center just does Monday through Friday, right. I believe. Yeah, I mean, the Senior Center does a great job. Um, Pamela Brown is the director there, and she does a, she's, uh, she's, uh, she's been here about two years, maybe very three. Very enthusiastic. Very, very much so. Yeah. And I, I, I was really blessed. I was fortunate. I. Um, I worked with the Council on Aging. I sat on the board that interviewed the candidates for uh, for her position. I was thrilled that Pam was interested in taking it. So uh, she's knowledgeable. She's yeah. had a career. She's done it. But she's done it. And, and I brought you know when I started here, I had 23 years of service in the housing in the affordable housing field. Now I've been I've been in the field for 30 years because I've been here seven years. And, um, and you're still a young man. It, well, it keeps you young. I'll tell you, <laughs> it's enjoyable, and I and I find it. Uh, you know, I found early on when I started doing this work back in the late 70s, you know, I got everything I needed from this kind of work. Um, it was a challenge, it was a decent income, not as much as I could make in the private sector. I liked seeing, giving people an opportunity to create an, and create an environment where they could prosper, not only uh, our disabled and elderly, but also families. And um, it answered, it gave me a lot back. I mean, I'm selfish in that regard too. I need, most people like to get something back I'm one of those folks who, uh, it's not just the money that makes me want to go to work. It's things, I have to feel like I accomplished something and it was important. Besides even enjoying your job. Yeah, and, and I made some, uh, that's something, that's You're an extra, focused. that's an extra level. If of, I may say that to Thanks. Me, that's the nice thing. I mean, that's an extra level of, of uh, um, you know, of give back that I'm looking for mm -hmm. in, my, in my, all the jobs I've done in my life. I've always been uh, doing things that, you know, I knew were important, and not only just important to me, but I walked away knowing that I tried to make that particular location a better place. And if the other people achieve what they want out of yeah, life, or a just better a, than you know. I mean, a lot of it, folks will do this on their own. You just simply have to give them the environment. Mm -hmm. You you remove obstacles so they can use their wheelchairs and walkers. You you provide them security so they can feel like they can come out of their apartment and 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 and, and be part of the general community. Uh, it does a tremendous amount for uplifting folks and making them feel 
uh, making their, you know, their days when they, would, they might be holed up in their homes, Make trying to assistance. manage their bills, yeah. rather than seeing their neighbors, especially in a town like Ainsley, where many of our seniors know each other. I mean, in a town of at least 16,000, that is if people send in their census cards. Um, <laughs> That's a hint. The mayor, <laughs> the, mayor just, the mayor talked to me about that just recently and said that they really weren't exactly sure how many people with names read because they, 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 don't, they rely so much mm -hmm. on those census counts. And I think a lot of people think this is going to do with my taxes. I'm going to get, they're going to find me. You know, jury duty? Ju no, I think that jury duty is more associated with, uh, um, it's more associated voting. with uh, voting, yeah, yeah, registering to vote. But, um, you know, it is, it is important for the town to know how many people are, are living here. It and it affects the tax rate, too, and it affects, you know, I believe how they get reimbursed from the Commonwealth. Um, this is, a, you know, I think that you can't talk about public housing Massachusetts without discussing the Commonwealth. We are, in the, in the field, are somewhat buoyed by um, the election of, the recent election of Deval Patrick. He seems to have, and, and also Tim Murray, Tim Murray as the lieutenant governor, a former uh, city mayor, a city ma uh, mayor of Worcester, with a fairly significant population of public housing, in Meadowbrook Farms and some other really large complexes, that's been a challenge for him. But we found them even before they took office. They met with housing authority directors. We went down to Chelsea, and um, some of my peers who had been in this business since they started had never had the opportunity to to tell to to give the concerns they had about housing to the. To, to the governor, mm -hmm. and Tim Tim Murray spent two hours wow. meeting with us. That's what you need. Someone and and actually turned aside after after he'd made the commitment to us, turned aside several other requests for his time, because he had, he said, "No, I'm committed to this. I really need it." So we found a realized we found a yeah we have more access I think, and and somebody who will listen to us, and at least somebody who appreciates our work. Uh, some of the previous administrations um, in, in the 16 years I think that since Bill Weld was governor, we didn't seem to have that kind of access. And they were, and you know, Bill had, Bill Walt had his problems. He had to rebuild the, the Commonwealth because it was in pretty dire straits. Because mm -hmm. uh, Mike Dukakis, and I, I think when he ran for president, um, he didn't tell people what was happening in Massachusetts. He ran on the Massachusetts miracle, but unfortunately, it was becoming a nightmare, and they tried to keep that. Do you think Romney will have the same issue, or do you think there's a lot, anything that will come up surprising with the housing or stuff that he didn't cover? Well, we see that. I mean, I we, try to stay out of politics. We were frustrated. We were there. frustrated um, because he. I mean, he's a businessman. And he, you know, he, he's he founder of Bain Capital. He's he's very wealthy. He's had national prominence not only in the business sector, but also um, uh, with the Olympics, the Winter Olympics. And you, you know, he made he made. I think it's kind of what he's running on, the the fact that that was a success yeah. and almost became yeah. a huge failure. Um, but you know, generally, although I think that there was some sympathetic, you can get all the sympathy you want, but the real the real when the rubber hits the road, you need money. You need to be able to fund projects, you need to be able to take care of buildings. We have a huge inventory in, in the Commonwealth um, of the housing that I spoke about earlier. And the uh, secretary, the, um, the audit, state auditor's office did a report two years ago, Joe Danucci's office, with regard to the condition of public housing in Massachusetts. That's right, next question I was gonna ask you. And the Kennedy School, um, which is part of Harvard, uh, also did a comparison three years ago of the shape of of our public housing inventory in Massachusetts. And they compared, we have basically two inventories here in Massachusetts. We have the state funded inventory, which are funded under state chapters that were legislation that had been passed in the last 50 years. And we have federal housing, which um, is operated through HUD, the, the uh, housing, Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is a federal uh, agency uh, and a secretariat under, under the president's, uh, in the president's cabinet. Um, and the Kennedy School found that um, the federal programs are so much better funded mm -hmm. because they got regular funding. They had an apparatus for modernization uh, called the Comprehensive Grant Process that allowed housing authorities and federal, federal housing to constantly get mod modernization money to upgrade their, their buildings. In Massachusetts, it's, it's sporadic. And, and as our inventory grows, it's be, you know, we are we're kind of behind the eight ball. The buildings is it like the greasy wheel thing, or well, it's, it it's there? just a matter of, of managing buildings. You always have to have an image. You always have to be modernizing the buildings. Things what, age. What, what area the money goes to must be hard to decide. Well, it's a decision that the legislature and the gov. I mean, the governor creates the budget. The legislature mm -hmm. approves it. Now, the legislature can and has, in in, in, in the past, added things um, that that because they could override a veto, they could actually get some of this money to housing authorities. 
But this time we have, everybody seems to be on the same page. And there is a pending legislation that may greatly improve the, the lot of housing authorities and their ability to fund not only their operations but their, their modernization. The, the Kennedy School study determined back three years ago that we, we were $970 million in, back mo in deferred modernization throughout our portfolio. That number is now over a billion dollars. And that's kind of like, you know, when you go under the underpasses and you see rusted out, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, members and you hear about concrete falling off of places. Well, our public housing inventory is, is, in some cases, the buildings have to have been shut down because they're no longer safe. And there are some housing authorities that are teetering on the brink of a, a catastrophe. I mean, one major catastrophic event could that basically close some of the buildings down in some of the That's cities. Scary, yeah. It is. I mean, it, it's because after 16 years of neglect and not getting the kind of money that we need to modernize, like our elevators need to be upgraded because they're not ADA compliant. Even they were built, the elevators in the tower here, we have two of them, they're 1977 vintage. That's when the tower was built. It's 30 years old. And they're not, they're not, they don't meet the, the, the modern day ADA requirements for accessibility. They don't have voice, uh, you know, Can you get a grandfather clause or anything? I mean, I'm not saying you want it. Well, because it's yes, actually, actually they are grandfathered in. But if we do any modernization work that's anything to the elevators, they're going to have to be upgraded because the grandfather clause ceases to exist when you have to do some, uh, make some changes to that that's particular thing. Yeah. But we also need roofing, and we need, I mean, sidewalks are a real problem for us. We have concrete stoops that after 30 years and 40 years of people using salt, um, they just, they crash. you couldn't have volunteers come in from the town and, and do anything. There's all sorts of liability them. issues that are yeah. involved. I mean, we have a very elaborate and very costly procurement process in the Commonwealth. When we go out to bid, we, it is a two to three year process sometimes to get work done. When the money is on the table, uh, we, one of the more recent jobs we did was um, at Heritage Vale, we replaced uh, windows and doors. The tenants, when I came here seven years ago, that's, they complained about the windows and doors. The windows are leaking, the doors are not doing their job. We have snow coming in around them in the winter time. And fortunately, um, we, we received about uh, 450, I think it was a $450,000 grant to provide windows and doors for those 43 units. It was about $1,000 a unit. But it took us two and a half to three years. We had to, we had to approve it. We had to have an approval of an engineer. You have all these other problems right. dropping up in two or three we had, years. I had to go, go into Boston and, and meet with the, um, with the board that oversees the granting of uh, the awarding of architectural engineering um, uh, awards to find a designer. And then we had to find that they would, that it takes them almost a year to draw up a project oh, yeah. for the replacements. And then they have to do uh, cost estimates. And then we go out to bid for a general contractor. And the general contractor has to meet all sorts of stipulations under Massachusetts state law to meet, to make prevailing wage, to make sure that they are they're properly insured, and this is the kinds of things you is want. That like a bid that they have bonds. Yeah, contractor with bid. Yeah, you have a competitive bidding process, and the winning bidder has to provide. Uh, you know, typically it's the the lowest reasonable and most responsible bid. It doesn't have to be the lowest right. bid. Yeah. It has to be the most I think responsible. People get confused bid. with that. They yeah. think it's the lowest bid. So you don't have to just take somebody who's totally uh, under because there's this little game that contractors play. They lowball, and then they come in for change orders and they change order you to death, and you end up paying more than if you are taking the middle oh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, contractor. So it's one of those challenges that, that you learn when Can you- Can you freeze it in the beginning if it's, uh, it's a billion dollar cost? No, because it's not fair. You do un unfortunately discover, I mean, especially if it involves uh, some demolition, if you're taking walls and mm -hmm. taking walls down, you never know what's inside a wall. Sometimes you find mold or you find asbestos that nobody knew was there. Um, and you know, especially with some of our buildings that are 40 years old, we, even though we have original drawings, drawings are nothing like uh, like they are today. Oh yeah, they are so much more detailed. Three today. dimension, you can do yeah, and they're, and they're computer around. generated today. In the old days, they used to used to be draftsmen that do a really blueprints. They were they're blue. I mean, that's why they're called blueprints. <laughs> you know, page um, after page. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's you know, it's one of those challenges. We don't we have not seen. I mean, for whatever reason, we've, we've gone through some neglect, and I'm not sure if it was by omission or commission, whether it was purposeful or whether people just didn't think it was important. But the end result is the same. I mean, our inventory of housing, and in Ainsbury, we're doing fairly well, but our, all of our projects could use some TLC. I mean, I, I, could, I really would like to get a new roof on, our, on the tower. It's, it's as old as the building. It's really past its useful life. What but would something like that cost? Probably about 250000 for the, for the square footage we have here. 
Um, and that's a ballpark. I mean, I, you know, I could be wrong, but I, I'm just guessing that's, that's kind of where I think it would fall in. There's a lot of square footage. You think of a good point, because once something's made and people live there and stuff, and, and even though there might be maybe elderly, look, not that you forget, but the world goes on in different directions. So when you come with a roofing, roofing issue or even plumbing, mm -hmm. people look at it like and it's, they think it's needed, but it drops down in priority. And Heritage, okay. Heritage Tower being a fairly, have a significant surface that is exposed, especially the northeast side of the building. That's the, that's the nine story part. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's exposed to the, a lot, a heightened wind pressure from the, from the ocean, that we have a problem with some of our living rooms and bedrooms where um, because the building is designed what they call a cantilever design, where it's uh, sawtooth design, yeah. it, that actually acts like a, almost like a, it amplifies the wind. And the wind is uh, kind of like a venturi in your carburetor or your, or your, you know, your car, where you have a large scoop and then it funnels down to a smaller space. And that pressurizes, if we have a wind-driven rain, that rain will find a crack. I mean, we have miles of well, seals. Or make a crack. <laughs> right. Well, we have miles, in, in a building of this size, miles of caulking literally, of cock beads that need to be replaced. I mean, and that is a huge project. They, you have to pe have people in scaffolding and bosun's chairs okay. going up and down yeah. the side of a building, cutting out the old caulking and replacing it with new. And that's never been done in this tower and it's 30 years old. So once again, we're fortunate that things, this building was well built and many of our buildings were well built and we maintain them as best we can, but the maintenance staff can't, they can tackle some things. We end up rebuilding kitchens and you know, because they, we just haven't had modernization projects where we've taken out whole kitchens and replaced them with new. Uh, so we end up using a lot of epoxy. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's not the way it should be, because that takes extra time for us to turn the unit oh, on. Yeah, yeah. And that means we're not getting rent for that unit, okay? So we have to, uh, you know, we're constantly in a battle of picking the low-hanging fruit. We will, we may have three or four units come up, we'll knock off the ones that are very little work, and get those, even though they're not the first ones on the list. Right. And we'll just we'll easy deal to, with them. Easy to get those out. And, and, and try to get the income on that unit because we basically live on our rents. We have a budget of a million dollars for the Ainsbury Housing Authority. And um, we get subsidy from the Commonwealth last year, 63,000 of that was a subsidy. And the primary reason for the subsidy is our, our energy costs. Our electric costs, are about a quarter of our budget, about $225,000 a year is for energy. And um, it's many of our units are electric. And that's heated. not going to get cheaper. Either. No, I, and I've done as much as I can. I actually have contracted out with a, 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 mid, um, um, a middleman provider uh, so we can buy our, our electricity at a bulk rate at slightly lower rates um, than if we bought them through our energy provider here. Right. Yeah. And, you know, through National Grid. So we still have to pay National Grid, but we, pay them, uh, we don't pay them for, for the, the bulk rate. We only pay them for the delivery of, this, of the electricity. Um, and we did really well. We had a really great contract for three years where we were paying considerably less than the market rate for kilowatt hours. But we went through a new contract last year, and even though we're still paying less than the going rate, it came up quite a bit. So I'm seeing some changes. More of our, our available cash is being absorbed by, en by the energy needs that we have in our building. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a challenge. I mean, it really is. If you could have what you wanted, if you could dream up a list that would make everything better, what would you do? Well, I think modernization would be walkways. One of the biggest challenges we have is some of the concrete and steps that we have, that, like I said, original. And even though they were fairly well made when they were, I mean, 30 years of heaving and falling, frost heaves and, mm -hmm. and salt and, and just w walking and settling, they, it takes their toll. Um, I would like to make this the best, look, some of the best looking housing in, in, in Ainsbury and really improve the curb appeal and not only make it safe inside the buildings, and make sure that people's, uh, they have decent sinks and, and operational uh, boilers are, are up to date. Because we have, you know, we have some old equipment here. I would like to um, make people, I mean, a lot of folks love living here, but I would like it to really spruce it up and make it look um, like the best stuff in town mm -hmm. and make people really happy about living here and be proud of it. When, when the grandkids pull up and, they, and they, they come to get grandma, I'd like them to be able to look up and say, wow, this is really a lovely building. I'm really thrilled that my mom is living here. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and that's really important to me uh, because I think that... Um, I really that's haven't been inside. I mean, cut you off. I've, I've been in other nursing homes and stuff like that. But uh, this, as far as the quick stop I made, it is very clean, very neat. People are happy. And I'm not cutting down any other nursing homes, but sometimes it's just the, the, maybe the staff isn't 
as well. many as there was. And so people really, they, you know, they kind of like, they're I there, mean, but when you go to visit them, you really kind of want to get out there as fast, you get out of it as fast as you can. Well, I mean, we're not, a, we're not a nursing home, right. but we do provide extra layers of services. We have a, we have a pilot program called Supportive Housing. Very few housing authorities. The only other housing authority in the Merrimack Valley that has it is McFillin. And I think Bill Recco, if that's in the Merrimack Valley. Yes, I think it is. Um, and what it allows is that those services I told you about, the nutrition program, mm -hmm. the, that's, that's been here for six years. Okay, I've been here for seven. Um, the nutrition program, we have a, somebody who comes in and looks in on people after hours. We actually took a okay, unit yeah. offline at Heritage Vale and a lady lives there, and, and she works for Elder Services, or actually a home care agency. Um, Elder Services pays us the dollar a year for that unit. And they actually pick the person who lives there, and that person comes in and checks on our folks. So if we have people coming back from a nursing home who need to have a look-in service, or they just came back and they just had an operation, or they just came out of rehab, they can ask to have somebody look in on them. If they don't have home care, I mean, we have other folks who have we have home care, um, um, home care staff that, that are here six days a week who do um, make beds, clean houses, make meals for people if they're, especially if they're unable to get out of their units right, yeah. and provide and take to do their laundry. They get their prescriptions for them down at CVS. Um, we have layer after layer of services that this building, this, these, the whole concept of this type of housing was for well elderly. Okay, it was, a, it was kind of, you know, the people used to live, when they retired, they would live in the walk-ups above the stores on Main Street. Right. And a lot of times they were cold water flats. Well, those are, those are no longer, and if there is housing above Main, it, it isn't cheap. And um, what they did was, they, and, th and this program was, was started back in the 50s. The first housing that was developed was for veterans in Massachusetts. And that was called, that's actually, we have chapter numbers, and that's the legislation that formed those, okay, and chapter 200 is the veterans housing, okay. Uh, then chapter 667 came about in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, and that was the first instance of housing designed specifically for the elderly. They're all single family, uh, one, I'm sorry, one bedroom, they could be multiple, but one bedroom so units. All, everybody in here is under a different code number? Well, not we have three or four different yeah. programs. Yeah. Um, we have uh, 205, 205 units under 667. We have uh, 27 units under Chapter 200. That's the Veterans Program. Chapter 667, once again, is for elderly and disabled, one bedroom. Um, we have uh, 705. That's another large family. Um, Let me the just numbers, but it's I know. nice to educate people at the same well, it's, time. Well, that's how we separate. That's how we individualize, and that's actually how we do our budgeting. And if anybody ever had the time and really wanted to um, explore this, they could look up Chapter 667 uh, and Chapter 689. That's housing for the disabled specifically that re requires 24 hour care. So we do have one for people who are chronically mentally ill. There are other housing authorities that have chapter 689 housing for uh, people who are severe and mental retardation. And that retardation. can be received by calling here to see what direction to go? Well, we don't have that. No, actually the, the, the chapter 689 program is, is taking, is managed by Health and Educational Services out of Beverly. They, they actually, we own the building, but the, the vendor, HES out of Beverly, actually provides the services and the staffing, okay? okay? Um, and that's unique. In most cases, we own the building and we take care of it and we, and we fill it, okay? Um, but there's probably a greater need in Ames Street for people with mental retardation who need additional housing and, because I know there's a huge backlog of uh, families that need housing for, especially where aging parents are caring for kids who uh, have mental retardation mm -hmm. issues, and they're getting to the point where they're in their 70s and 80s. I think that's something people don't really consider. That's a either. real, tra yeah. that's a, almost a tragedy that has to be addressed by the Commonwealth. I think it's unfortunately that's growing. Point. The, the Department of Mental Retardation is trying to play catch up ball, but they are way behind the eight ball when it comes to providing adequate housing. Um, for At least that's my understanding. Uh, if there are any advocates for the Department of Mental Redotation, <laughs> I'm sure we will get a phone call. <laughs> but I'm just trying to say, and I think nobody would argue, up. that there is not enough housing for people with mental retardation in this Commonwealth. So, uh, and, and, and for people so chronically mentally So that's one of your wish lists that we have housing for them. Right. I think it's, it's something that we have to do. I also think there's, there needs to be, um, you know, I think there are additional care facilities that we need to contemplate, uh, like the Assisted Living Center in Salisbury. Um, 
that I think Ainsbury could use a bit of that as well. Um, and that's something I'm looking into. Um, Do you have entertainment here? I mean, as far as, you know, like We don't coordinate. Like we have a very stuff. active, uh, in, in, in both Heritage Tower, we have the Heritage Tower and Vail uh, Tenants uh, Residents Association. They're very active and we don't direct them. I mean, they have, they collect, they have penny sales, they collect dues, they have monthly meetings. Currently, the president is uh, Phil Danderant, uh, who has oh, been yeah, a longtime yeah. resident yeah. here. And uh, Phil is also on the board for the Ainsbury Housing Authority. And let me name the other board members while I'm at it. Uh, Lawrence Quinn, who lives on Friend Street, is, uh, is a board member. He's one of the senior board members. Uh, Al Landry, who is a, a resident of ours, lives on Nascent Court, is a board member. One of our newest members is Ray Shockey, who used to run the Alliance. Okay, yeah. Ray has just started. Matter of fact, he may be downstairs signing checks as we speak. Um, <laughs> and we have still, uh, we have a vacancy from an uh, individual uh, fellow named Bob Mitchell, who is our state representative for many years. He passed away back in November of 05, I believe it was, and that vacancy has not been filled by the Commonwealth. That is a governor's appointee. That's out of our hands. I mean, we have four members who are elected officials who, because we're a town, at least in that aspect, they have to be, they're on the ballot. Would, it, would they run that by you for questioning? No. Nope. I mean, like, they just nope. come from the They go to the clerk. They go to Bonnie over at the over at Town Hall, and she'll set them straight uh, for what their needs are. Um, but I, I really, you know, I, the board is a huge asset uh, because they give you, you know, they give you in inputs from the community. Mm -hmm. and it's really important because we do have elected officials here mm -hmm. in the town. Cities do it differently. In the cities, a mayor appoints and the city council approves. And that's all in 121 cha uh, one, chapter 121B, which is the statute that is the foundation for Massachusetts housing authorities. And that's Massachusetts general law, MGO 121B. That is where housing authorities get the, their statutory authority to, to function in Massachusetts government. And that has to be changed by the state legislature. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, often. Yeah. They, uh, I always get, uh, I have the, the statute and I also get updates every year. It's like having an ongoing subscription service where they send you what they call pocket parts. You just slip it into the book and it shows the legislation that was deleted and what was added for oh, that wow. particular year. So if anybody has the time and interest, they can you know, go on the mask.gov website and enjoy. And that's lots of reading there. Um, anyway. Anyone, you have any more you want to add before we finish? No, I think, uh, I, I think I covered it all. I hope I answered all your questions. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I am going to show Larry a unit, and maybe he'll have time to put that into uh, his, uh, his uh, you know, uh, video presentation. We'll make time. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we do here um, because it's great work. And I only hope that we can get the kind of financial assistance we need to make our housing as safe and secure as possible. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for your time. Larry. And as you can see, he's very focused, energetic, and really, besides wanting to do a good job, he does do a good job. And uh, so get out around town more, and we'll catch you later. Work hard, stay healthy. We're out here. bedroom apartment at Heritage Tower, 180 Main Street, is actually on the fifth floor, which um, on the front of the building is the ground floor, um, because it's uh, Heritage Tower is nine stories from the rear of the building and five from the front of the building. This is a fairly typical unit. Um, it is approximately 450 square feet of living space. It contains closet space, some large closet space in both the living room and the bedroom. And um, in some apartments we have a, a small linen shelf and others we don't, but they're generally the same. We have a considerable amount of cabinetry available in the kitchen for our storage. We also provide a frost-free uh, refrigerator in, in uh, the tower. And um, some of our older units don't have frost-free yet, but we can't afford to replace them, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and we maintain these units. Our, ma our maintenance staff is available 24-7 for emergency cases. We have an answering service that will contact them if um, one of our tenants calls uh, with an emergency that um, meets the criteria for a maintenance call. So um, people are welcome to apply. If you're, over, if you're over 60 years of age or if you're disabled, you can come to 180 Main Street or write us a letter at Ainsbury Housing Authority, 180 Main Street, Ainsbury, Mass, 0913. 
and request that we send you an application for our housing, we'd be happy to forward it to you. Our waiting list is not terribly long, and if you are a certain preference category, like you're a veteran and you are an Ainsbury resident, you will go right to the top of the list, and the only people in front of you will be veterans from Amesbury who applied before you. So I urge you to con contemplate that. This is, a great, this is a great community for people to live in. And um, a lot of the problems in, of living by yourself are, are, are met here, and um, a lot of our tenants find it to be very enjoyable, secure housing. So um, we have nutrition programs here. We have uh, a community where people look in at each other. We actually have um, somebody who can look in on you if you're, uh, if you're convalescing coming back from uh, nursing home care or rehab. We have seven days a week we offer a meals program so that you can get at least one meal a day uh, and, and, the, and the requested donation is two dollars so you can live fairly inexpensively and eat pretty well. We have a lot of great folks who have some good community programs at our community center here. We have movies on Thursday nights um, and we're looking forward to expand those services. So uh, the, uh, the community here is only as good as the members that, uh, that are a part of it and if you have some energy and interest uh, and you move in here, I hope that you'll consider uh, being a part of our community and being involved. Uh, once again, 450 square feet, pretty much carefree. We provide the, the electricity for heat. Um, there's no utility bills with the exception of cable and telephone. Those are not included. Um, but all the, all, the, all the utilities you need to have a, to, uh, to have a home are provided. And um, you should contemplate uh, either if you're old enough to qualify or if you have a loved one that you'd like to see live in better housing, you should contemplate having them come and, uh, and take an application. We'll do our best. Okay, we have a full bath that's also included in our one bedroom units. And we have uh, two large closets and actually a linen space in the bedroom. Um, it is not huge by any means, but it's just enough for a lot of folks who is, are tired of living in big homes by themselves and paying those utility bills and arranging for somebody to shovel their walk. It's all care. We take care of that here. Plus, it's a safer building because our building is monitored by the fire department. And if you burn toast, we will have company. The fire trucks will be here and the ambulance. Uh, we have a lot of folks who do 911 calls. We have a great, we work very closely with the Amesbury Fire Department and the police department as well. And they've been very supportive. Hello, I'm at the Powwow Villa, where today we'll be picking up some food through the serve program, and we'll be talking with Lorraine Olette. So let's go ahead and check it out. Welcome. This is Lorraine Olette, and she is the coordinator of the serve program at the Powwow Villa. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Larry. Mm -hmm. now, how long have you been doing this? Um, I think it's our 12th year. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, we started from the Amesbury Council of Churches, um, one of the representatives. Um, mentioned serve program so we we started it then um we had volunteers that um we also just massage were the coordinators and then i took it over after i retired so it's all volunteers it's all vo yep all volunteers now how do you get on the program if somebody was interested uh, they just need to uh call me um and then i can give them the information my telephone number is 603-394-2000 um Anyone can join the program. It's a, it's a volunteer organization. The only requirements are that they do two hours of community service um, a month. Is there an age bracket? No, nope, doesn't matter, and it's not an income level. It's not uh, subsidized by the government. It's basically it's like a food co-op. Mm -hmm. The coffee mine. The food is purchased uh, just, yeah, uh, in, in bulk so that really they can get uh, oh, better, better prices. So you, know, you probably always need volunteers and stuff. Then. We can always use volunteers, right. Now once a month, there'll be a flyer like this, so you get it with a package. Mm -hmm. We get a newspaper, and then it tells them what's available the following month, mm -hmm. so that they can order. If they don't like what's on the menu, they can, you know, it's not something that they have to do every month. They choose to do it whenever they're ready. And are they scattered around town any place other than here? Uh, we have them at the Senior Center, and then also um, the Housing Authority, um, take orders for me, the Powell Villa, and the Newburyport Housing. So, uh, but if, if anybody has access to it, the internet, they can order through the internet and pick up at our site if that's what they want to do. Does Powell Villa have a site or do they go through the Ainsbury site? 
Um, so. it, it, we just use this room because it's very convenient. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's not a Powell Villa. It's just that the the uh, the room is very available, and it's easy to get out, like in the winter time, so that we don't have a problem. Now, do you have to be from Ainsbury, or can you nope. be? just locally like somewhat anyone can at? purchase anywhere it's just that oh, if okay. they want to pick up in Amesbury then they give our number um, to the um, where they want to pick up their food so there's no fees to join or nothing like that no you just come in and right fill out a form probably and get right started. right yep. oh, really? and uh, again <laughs> if they if they uh, have yeah. access to the internet they can also they with a credit card mm -hmm. and they can also do food stamps oh, wow. um, we take we accept and food stamps um, so it's, it's pretty much open to anyone. Oh, We're always looking for new people to join us. Oh, excellent. Um, Lorraine's going to walk me through the process yeah. so I can pick up the food for my parents once in a while. So okay. we'll give it a shot. I can come here a hundred times and still not know what to do. So. <laughs> All right. All right. We, we um, set up the order for next month, and the food will be coming in on the 21st of April. Okay. So we usually order the first of the month, and then it in about two weeks then the food com it comes in once a month normally at the end of the month and it'll be a big one for um next month uh, a turkey or something well we have extra turkeys but those are already all sold oh. so we can't <laughs> we can't order um i'm always late yeah <laughs> now were you going to order the family meal uh today or um i think so this is what she wrote down okay yep Th that's family. for last month oh no, what are you I got a do? check and a dollar on that. Okay. Let's see, that's that's your last <laughs> one. I told you, see? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But see, what your mother wants this month is just the family. I'm going to blame it on you, Ma. <laughs> okay. But now we you're on tape do. this June, <laughs> and she'll give you um, your order that you ordered for this month. Okay. And this is your check for this month. And we are asking the people um, to put in money for the gas because... Gas is so expensive, and it we have on wonderful. We have wonderful volunteers that have been with us for ten years to go pick up the food in Manchester, New so Hampshire. New Hampshire. So mm -hmm. that's where our warehouse is, our site, our distribution center, mm -hmm. and um, they have been wonderful. So uh, we are finally giving them a little gas money. Well, this is what the flyer looks like. So I'm um, look around town. I'll get in contact with Lorraine. She'll be glad to help you out. Does it? Does this number have anything? Nope. Um, okay. My home phone number, you can leave me a message, is 603-394-2000, um, and I will get back to you. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you very much, Larry. And this is what this town's about, people helping people. So I'll catch you later. Bye. Hi, June. Lorraine Hi. sent me over with the slip to pick up my parents' right. stuff. No, I got an extra. Thank you. You have one family meal. Okay. And you now have a chicken. And one chicken. One chicken. So I think with this is potatoes and carrots and all that stuff? Yes. Vegetables. Carrots, Bananas. onions, wow. fruit. Looks nice. Yep. Now this is once a month. Once a month. And all we have to do is just the process we did with the... Pay the thirty-seven dollars, whatever the price of the meal is, right? And then right next month down, give it to you, right? And that's it. That's right. And how long have you been doing this? Well, oh, since it started, um, <laughs> which I don't know how long it's been. Uh, probably ten to fifteen years, something like that. Probably since the very beginning. Yeah, it's all since volunteers. all yes, all volunteers. Do you live in Powell Village? I now live here. Okay. I started before uh, before I lived here, but I, yeah. What I was going to ask is. Um, how would somebody? This is assistant yeah. living. Is that what they call it? Hi, yeah. Lorraine. Well, no, this is assistant living. This is this is elderly housing. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's good to correct yeah. me because yeah. many people may not. Yeah. Know uh, are you trying um, to get out? How do you get in here if you needed to <laughs> to live? You have to apply at the housing, Amesbury Housing Authority, okay. which is yeah, on is at the, near the towers at the towers the yeah. office. You have to fill out a form with all all oh, of the I'll, stuff I'll on it one. and make sure you have all your. You know, guess, everything, you know, like Social Security and all that stuff. Is it a yeah. requirement? I, uh, I don't, it, it, it could be, but I, it might be 55, but it can't, you know, it depends. Okay. Yeah. And you have places to do the laundry and the 
Yep. Just oh, the laundry room is right there. Yep. yep. And yep. I think one time you told me they had like an outside barbecue or something. Oh, we do that every year. Every here, year. just here, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Powell Villa. Powell Villa, yeah. yeah. How many residents usually? About we, how many well, residents? we have 60 units here. Okay. Just in this area of Powell. Yeah. And uh, out of that, um, I would say maybe we get uh, probably 20, 22, maybe even more than that. We also get their families come to. Well, it's all outside, yeah. Now, can it be a husband and wife, or is it usually? Oh yeah, there's a hundred. There's a couple that have couples that live here. Oh great. It's only two and a half rooms, small, yeah. but efficient. But it's affordable too. Oh definitely. Well, does it work it's off of an income type of a thing? Or? Yeah, okay. depends on how much. You, yeah. And everybody just helps each other out. Is it taken care of by the town, the grounds? The housing. The housing. Done by housing. Okay. Yeah. Housing does the plowing, shoveling, the whole. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And you're very happy being here. Yes, it's kind of nice to stand at your window and look out and see him mowing the lawn, <laughs> shoveling the snow, and I don't have to do it. <laughs> and I wave and say thank you. <laughs> now, do you want to just say your last name so people know who you are? And jo I'm June Grover, G R O V E R. Make sure you wave to her and thank her for her volunteerism. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is our town. Catch you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'd like to introduce Tiffany from the Pettengale House in Salisbury. Nice to meet you. Could you tell us a little bit about the Pettengale House? Sure, we're a social service ag agency in Salisbury. We opened up in 1994, and we collaborate with um, programs such as the SERVE program. Um, they donated fo food to us the past several years, which oh. is wonderful. And all of that food serves clients from the surrounding areas, Amesbury, Salisbury, Newburyport, and beyond. Um, many families, we've served over 90,000 meals over the past year, and it grows every year, which is amazing. That's excellent. Yes. Is there a number they could reach you at, or yep. would you prefer someone not to call you? <laughs> nope, 978-463-8801, and we're at 13 Lafayette Road in Salisbury. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Do you um, have a website or anything? Um, nope, but that's, that's um, soon thing? coming, yes, <laughs> yes. Is it regular 40 hour, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Yep, Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5, Friday by appointment only. Um, are you allowed to say what the house does? Is it um, like I said, we're a social service agency. We have a food pantry on site. Okay. Um, we're involved with the area schools, um, our schooling services program, where we go in and we support the families. We act as the homeschool community liaison. So if there's ever a meeting that um, a parent is involved with, we can go oh, help great. them understand what the meeting's about, break down the barriers. Um, and then get all the support services that the families need that they might not know that are. And you in seem like you really enjoy your job too. Absolutely. I, I can see it in your yeah. face. Our town, it's our town, our town on TV. Our town, that's you and me. Our town, upside down.